everybody, welcome. Hi. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. It's Fishtail's birth tonight, and uh, really excited to have you all here. What I normally do is a few announcements before we get started, and then I'll do some thank yous, and then we'll get these storytellers up here um, right away. So the Gloucester Writers' Center hosts Fish Tales, and we've been doing this show for almost five years, if you can believe that. Yes. It's quite an accomplishment just for the audiences that have been here, the storytellers, and, uh, and we've never had a repeat. Well, but well, hold on a minute, we have one repeat, my favorite story storytelling, rock and roll. But other than that, it's been all original, um, never repeat themes, and uh, we we'll hope to continue that. I want to thank all of our storytellers tonight for being brave <laughs> and willing to be here to tell their personal stories about birth. And it really is all about creation. I know a few of the stories tonight, and others I, I haven't heard all the way through, so uh, I'm going to be uh, listening as much as all of you. I'd like to again thank the Writers' Center and Annie and Henry for supporting us in this program for all these years. I'd also like to thank Kit Cox and Chassie Robinson for bringing this theme to me. They represent the North Shore Postpartum Task Force and how long have you been working on this? Maybe a year or so, at least a year. And here we are finally, uh, it's September, having this show. This has been a lot of labor. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thanks, Kit. Make sure you read Kit's t-shirt. <laughs> um, we have a full lineup. Before we get started, I would like to invite Chassie and Kit co to come up and talk about the North Shore Postpartum Task Force. So, um, my name is Chassie. I'm here representing the task force tonight. I see a lot of familiar faces in the room. Uh, the task force started uh, back in 2007 with a $5,000 donation from the United Way. Um, we've been meeting ever since on a monthly basis. We're either at Beverly Hospital or Addison Gilbert Hospital. Um, we have lots of members. We have community members. We have clinicians, educators, parents. Um, we all share the same uh, passion for supporting women, their children, and families. Uh, so I think of the task force as a working group, so we come together on a monthly basis um, to get things done. Sometimes that takes the form of a diaper drive throughout the North Shore to raise um, money or gather diapers to donate to Open Door or other pantries. Um, sometimes it takes the form of legislative advocacy. Um, and sometimes it takes the form of just pulling together a support group for new moms. Um, it's been a wonderful thing to be part of. We'd welcome anybody to show up at one of the meetings. Kit always brings chocolate. Um, and it's been um, a wonderful thing. And each year um, we try to do uh, something with the arts. So um, this has been something we've been talking about for a year. Um, and it's really wonderful to see such a great turnout. So thanks for coming out. Um. There are a number of members or husbands of members here. If you're part of the group, could you stand up for a second just so we know who's here? So if you have more questions afterwards, please feel free to talk to these folks and um, they can give you more information. There's also brochures by the door. Thank you. Well, let's get started with our fabulous lineup. Our first storyteller is Anita Pendolfi. Good evening. So my story uh, takes place in 1974. I was living in Brookline, Massachusetts. I was 22 years old and a college dropout. Uh, I was living in a commune, a spiritual community on Chestnut Hill Avenue, a big brick house with 12 of us. And we were meditating together and uh, doing all sorts of interesting explorations in consciousness. Um, and I was contemplating what I was going to do with my life beyond 
meditating and exploring consciousness. And one of the things that came up was the um, desire to um, assist with birth. And in what capacity, I thought, well, I'll explore midwifery. And it was the 70s. There were no schools for training midwives in Massachusetts. So I thought, well, maybe I should become a nurse and then use that path to become a midwife. But I wasn't sure. And so I was looking into schools in the Boston area. And uh, it was December. It was snowing. And the next day, I had an interview. I think it was LaSalle Junior College. But I happened to know that there was a hit of LSD in the refrigerator. <laughs> and so I thought that it was meant for me. <laughs> that night, as the snow began to fall, now my roommates were uh, concerned <laughs> and said, do you really know what you're doing? And I said, yes. It's calling to me. This is, this is the right time. <laughs> so I, I took the LSD. I meditated in my room. The snow started coming down. It was brilliant. There were spotlights outside, and everything was glowing. And um, after a while, I decided I needed to be out in the snow. So one of my roommates decided to follow me. And I trudged up Chestnut Hill. And I saw these bright lights at the top of the hill. And I was following the lights. And uh, Margot was about 10 steps behind me. And uh, there were mansions there. If anyone knows that area, Fisher Hill, I think it's called. There were mansions. And I was following the light, literally. And then I found myself in this field. And the snow was coming down, all lit up. I don't know how many people in the room have ever taken LSD, but <laughs> you're of the generation, you know what I'm talking about. So those snowflakes were multi-dimensional. And, <laughs> and, and I'm trudging along, and it's, and it's all white. And, and I look up all of a sudden, and I realize there's someone in front of me. And she's huge. And, her arms are up in the air like this. And I realize, even in my LSD state, that it's a statue. <laughs> but she's about nine feet tall. And her arms are up like this, and she has wings. And she's holding up in her hands a baby. And behind her, on a big concrete slab, it says, the spirit of life. So this was my sign <laughs> to go and become a midwife. And so I would go back to that spot, and I would meditate there. And it turns out when it thawed that there was a big pool of water in front of her. And it was a very incredibly peaceful spot on top of Fisher Hill. And so I did apply to nursing school, and I ended up going to Mass General Hospital School of Nursing. I felt like an insider imposter, because little did they know what I was thinking in grand rounds. Um, <laughs> and they used to make fun of me, you know, she stands on her head every morning. But I got my training, and I went right into midwifery. Um, uh, I went right into maternity care in hospitals. Midwives showed up to train me. Doctors showed up to train me. I uh, went on to have uh, three babies that I gave birth to myself. But I had the honor and the privilege to attend hundreds of births. And then when I told the story to someone, they said, you should go back to that statue because she, she was in my heart. So I had the opportunity to go back and to photograph her. So I brought her here for you to see. So what happened was, I went, and they had changed the whole place, and I couldn't get at the statue. It was fenced in and locked. And I started to cry. And my friend said, knock on the door. And it was the Mary Baker Eddy Museum. And this was a statue that this family 
I can't remember their names at the moment, had created to give thanks for their babies. I told the woman my story, minus the LSD, <laughs> and, and how I had become a midwife and had the honor to attend so many births and receive so many babies. And she said, well, we happen to have a board meeting going on right now. And she said, I'll be right back. And she went and came back with a special form for me to sign to promise that I would never use the image for commercial purposes, but she let me photograph. And so here she is. So maybe she'll sit here while everyone tells their birth story. That's awesome. Thank you. Everybody needs a guardian angel. We have one for this show. Um, actually, it's very meaningful for me, too. Our next storyteller it has been a supporter of Fishtails from the very beginning. Please welcome Elizabeth Enfield. I hope I'm not too loud because Anita is much quieter. She's a good friend of mine. And mine's going to be more like George Allen and Gracie. In uh, 1976, about the same time as her story, I was living in Maine. I was married and uh, had just gotten divorced October 10th. And I was on my way in November to do an antique show in Vermont with a friend of mine and a dog beside us. And then all of a sudden, there must have been a blackout because I woke up four days later on the trip. I was in Lewiston Hospital, and I had to stay there because I had broken a femur bone, I lost an eye, and it was a very intense accident. And I was there for about a month. And I had a couple of operations, and the doctor, before doing an operation on my leg, would say, are you pregnant? And I said, why? And they said, well, we have to put a guard up if you're pregnant. And I said, oh, no, I'm not pregnant. And so they did the operation. And a few days later, the orthopedist came in, and he said, well, we didn't check your pelvis. We want to see uh, if there's breaks up there. So they did another, and the doctor said, or another doctor said, are you pregnant? I said, no, I'm not pregnant. So they did it without protection, and they found some pelvis broken, so I had some pins added to that. And then uh, I was in during Thanksgiving and during Christmas, and I got out, and I went home to recuperate. I was living in a little town in Maine, and... Um, I hadn't seen my parents, and when I felt I could go down to see them, I drove, or I took a bus, I think I took the Greyhound bus, where they promised that I could go handicap status, I would get a seat, but nobody got up, and I was on crutches in the middle of the aisle on the way down. Prior to that, uh, during physical therapy, I would get nauseous and throw up. So I thought, what's going on here? Am I like allergic to something? I mean, there's no medication. Maybe I don't like my therapist, so I thought, you know, <laughs> I threw up. So then I went down to Rhode Island, and I was walking on the beach with my friend Marvin and Emily, and all of a sudden I fainted. And I'm really, I'm never sick. I mean, I have a big accident, but I never, like, drop. And I was on the beach sand, and I said, I don't know. And I started thinking, I have cancer. My God, you know, I dropped on the beach. So I said, I'm going down to New York to see my parents, to my friends, but I'm, I'm going to go to a doctor. So then I had asked the doctors in the hospital, I said, after a month, I didn't get my period. And the guy goes, oh, don't worry about it. Women have trauma and they lose their period. It's nothing. So again, I believe this. I don't think anything. And while I'm recuperating, I'm eating a lot. My next door neighbor took me in because my pipes were frozen in my house. So I'm watching fish floating in this big tank. She had these koi and all these Chinese fish floating around. And then I got on the bus, someone drove me to the Greyhound, and I went to New York. And then one day, the next day, I went to look for an obstetrician, and I went to see a doctor on Fifth Avenue. And he puts me into this, you know, in a big room, and there's a table, and he says, you lie down. I said, fine. And um, he puts this box on my stomach, and I hear, boom, 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 
boom, boom. And I'm going, oh my God, Rosemary's baby. I mean, what? <laughs> so he comes to me and he looks down and he takes my wrist and he says, this is your pulse. I said, yes. And he puts his hand here. He says, this is your heart. I said, yes. And then he takes the box away and he puts his hand here and he says, you are pregnant with a six months baby. I never knew. I said, that's not possible. I have a master's degree. I'm, 30, I'm 32 years old. I would know if I'm pregnant. And I was wearing a jumpsuit, it was tight, but you know, I had lost a lot of weight. And so I ate again and I just thought, you know, I was going back to normal. So I said, what am I gonna tell my parents? My father's picking me up out, you know, inside the hospital and my mother. And so I go down, I get in the car, and my father stops for gas on the way uptown. And I go to my mother. I just went to an obstetrician. I'm having a baby. Don't tell your father. <laughs> what do you mean, don't tell my father? I'm 32 years old. I'm not 16, 13 years old. I said, okay, I won't tell him. So we get back to the, <laughs> we get back to the apartment, and my mother calls up my brother, who lives across the highway and he's happily married with a couple of kids and all that. So he comes over, and we had dinner, and then my mother said, okay, Elizabeth has something to tell you. And they, I don't know, I'm not gonna tell you my nickname, because it sticks like glue. <laughs> so my father's standing against the wall, and my mother's sitting over here, my brother's over there, and I said, I went to an obstetrician today, I'm having a baby. And so it was kind of quiet, I thought someone was gonna yell, and my father said, well, my father, your grandpa Harry, he'll think it's okay because you won't be alone. It'll be really nice. But you can come to Florida. I mean, I was going to Florida with him. I was supposed to have a respite, but now I was pregnant going to Florida, which was really something else. So that's really about it. So I was six months pregnant, and I gave birth in July to my miracle baby, Mauro, who's now 41 years old, and I have two grandchildren. And thank you for listening. I'm so pleased to welcome back to the Fish Jail stage, Virginia McKinnon. Well, this was during Hurricane Carol, September 18, 1954. My first child was born. Dr. Irving, the doctor that delivered me, came into the labor room. He was attending another patient. He says, what are you taking? He asked, and I held up my rosary beads. He said, don't be a martyr. <laughs> well, I wasn't gonna miss this big event. And I, you know, every person that came into this world came in through a woman, and I could do this too. <laughs> and besides, my husband said, he warned me, Make sure you bring the right baby home. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there my son, Hillary, was born. He was a perfect baby. He, he looked like my Irish husband. He didn't look at all like the Italian babies in my family. So I asked Dr. Ross, I says, how much does he weigh? And he says, six, seven. Well, I was working in the insurance office, and that was a telephone number. In those days, you said, six, seven, you know. And... Uh, <laughs> I says, I looked at the clock, it was quarter past 11 at night, and I thought the insurance office is closed, why is he calling them? <laughs> so, so then I asked again, he says, six pounds, seven ounces. Well, I gained 40 pounds on my pregnancy, I says, how could this be true? <laughs> but my husband, my Italian mother and father and grandmother, they were all in the waiting room and I was wheeled by them in just a, in one minute. And, and then they took me into this dark six bed baby ward and everybody was asleep and I was so hungry I hadn't eaten or drank anything all day because I left early because of the hurricane. And if I had a home birth, my mother would have been there with my grandmother giving me nice food and attention. <laughs> so on September 18th, 1955, my, my son's first birthday, my daughter Lola was born. Well, I would remind my son, what do you want for your birthday? He'd say, baby sister. But he was, he says he was too young to ask for the tricycle he rather would have had. 
Do Nurse Q delivered Lola as Dr. Ross had gone home and he didn't get back in time. Then Lola was thrilled as she welcomed her baby sister, Mary Ellen, almost three years later. And I telephoned Dr. Ross as I was leaving for the hospital. And uh, he said, just take two aspirin, he says, and call me in the morning. <laughs> and the, the, when I got to the hospital, the nurses were laughing. They said, you know, he was here all night. He, he just left an hour before, and he was hoping to get a good night's sleep. Well, Hillary kept waiting for baby brother, and on June 11, 1959, my mother answered the phone and announced the birth of my twin daughters. And she said, Hillary, you're still the king. What, no brother? Oh, knowing twins would do, he's so sure he's gonna have a baby brother. The twins were fraternal, and when Dr. Lacey saw them, he says, one's from Italy and one's from Ireland. <laughs> And little Italian Regina had a mop of jet black hair. And the Irish Roberta had only a little blonde peach fuzz. <laughs> I asked to stay in the hospital an extra day because my twin sisters were graduating from high school. So the next day they came and they each carried a baby out of the hospital. And they're my twin godmothers. Imagine going home with five children all under five years old. <laughs> My life was so structured and disciplined. Living in East Gloucester, all my family was in Central Gloucester. Nighttime would come and I'd envy the prisoners in jail because they were all asleep and I was off all night <laughs> feeding babies. Oh, well, my husband had to learn to cook breakfast because I was so busy changing diapers. I had three in diapers. My mother came to help when she could. Well, Hillary wasn't disappointed because he finally did have a baby brother. Mike was born three years later in 1962. And he was, Hillary was so proud to be a big brother. Mike was my largest baby, he was seven pounds, 11 ounces. He was so loved by the other siblings, especially the three-year-old twins. They would get his clothes ready the night before and they would, uh, and they would dress him in the morning. They planned all kinds of activities for him because the, <laughs> the other three were in school. So on the beautiful October morning in 1963, I called Dr. Ross as my seventh baby's birth was imminent. Well, he was out in his boat and he answered on the ship to shore telephone and soon he arrived at the hospital and the nursing staff, they were changing shifts at three o'clock and the nurse attending me was reading her newspaper and I announced, well, my baby's coming and everyone got so excited, they were all scurrying around the room and I was the only calm person in the room. <laughs> My seventh child, Carol, was welcomed into my family and all the other children became caregivers and taking care of Carol. I celebrated my 10th wedding anniversary on Thanksgiving Day, 1963, with seven children, all beautiful and all so healthy. Well, my living room had been converted to my master bedroom and then my son shared the master bedroom. My husband and I slept on the sofa in the, in the den and the girls slept upstairs in two bedrooms, but no one slept in the kitchen. <laughs> so we had outgrown our little Cape home on Hart Street of 10 years, and we moved into our new raised ranch home with five bedrooms and two bathrooms on Stanwood Terrace. We celebrated living 50 years on Stanwood Terrace in April. Every Sunday afternoon at two o'clock, my 92-year-old husband and I, joined by our children, and we have dinner, no more pasta and meatballs. We mostly have baked haddock. <laughs> Sometimes we have steak and once in a while we'll get Chinese takeout. My youngest son does the cooking and my daughters clean up. And if I try to help, I'm reminded, Ma, this is your day off. You just sit down and relax. Never disappoints, ever. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Martin Ray as our next storyteller.
My story is called Birth and Brains. <laughs> the convergence of birth and brains first occurred to me in ninth grade in science and health class. That class was taught by the soccer coach at an all-boys school called Staten Island Academy. Well, the coach was not an authority on either birth nor brains. <laughs> but luckily, the smartest kid in the class, Steve Lewiski, was the son of a doctor. Now, Steve was an authority on many subjects, and he was anxious to enlighten us. So one day, Steve helped the coach by clarifying for us all the scientific insight that we humans only use 10% of our brains. He was not referring just to adolescent boys. <laughs> so I'm going to vault over the next 10 years of my life that I spent pondering birth and brains in high school and college and the Army. I came to Gloucester. I married a wonderful woman and began giving deeper consideration to birth and brains. We bought a fixer-upper house. By the time that we went to the Topsfield Fair in 1975, we were already pregnant and on the road to post-60s fulfillment. <laughs> we brought uh, chickens and goats to the custody of our shepherd dog, Otter, at our homestead on East Main Street. The pure white doe goat named Libra was pregnant too. Now Libra was the first one to go into labor the next March. My part in the successful delivery of her kid Aries was to provide plenty of fresh straw for the floor of the shed. Libra panted and bleated and gave birth. I appreciated the miracle. Now, Dorothy had been to Lamaze classes over the winter to prepare for labor. She bonded with the other young mothers-to-be, and the contractions started. So we hustled up to Addison Gilbert Hospital, where we met Mother Cool, the tiny, wrinkled nurse in charge of childbirth. She wore a blue-green smock. She looked like an ancient crone from the Azorian Hills or maybe a Buddha. <laughs> well, I was amazed to find myself in this most sacred of places. Mother Cool peered right in, her face just inches away from the event, holding Dorothy's hand. She would say, that's right, dear. You're doing beautifully. Now, push to Mother. And Dorothy would say, yes, Mother. And in no time, they bonded with the, with the force and intimacy of all time. Well, once or twice, Dr. Ross came by from the obstetrical office down the street to get a report. How's the dilation, Mother Cool? Vital signs? And he would go away reassured he had a good brain. As birth and brains converged, the full team assembled. Dorothy started panting and bleeding. <laughs> I knew that I had been there before on the straw floor of the shed. Well, this time, the miracle to emerge was my brand new son, Marco. It was clear to me that bringing life through the body, through that heroic canal, involved the riskiest compromises imaginable for mother and child. The design idea was to get the child as advanced as possible without killing the mother. The biggest challenge was that oversized head of the baby, the part with the brains, the special gem of humanity. My mind knew what to conclude. Science could not measure this. It was a matter of brains. Now, there is, there is extravagance in nature, but no waste. There is redundancy in nature, but no waste. Every ounce of that newborn brain is essential, all 100%. That massive head is pared down to the absolute minimum to allow us to develop into smart humans and still survive birth. I 
I'd love to invite Steve Lewiski here to be the next speaker. <laughs> to, hope, to hope for a surprise or two from this smart kid at Staten Island Academy. Then I'd like to call Mother Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Mother Cool? How cool is that? <laughs> Mother Cool. <laughs> True. Um, our next storyteller is a first time storyteller here. Layla Goodman, please take the stage. This is like the Bird Canal. <laughs> um, I'm a doula, and a doula is a woman who does birth, like just labor support for a woman giving birth and her partner. I'm not a midwife, I don't do any of the medical stuff, I just give support. But I actually have a full-time job as a teacher, so I'm just a doula on the side, and I don't take any money for it. It's really part of my spiritual practice. It's just an amazing thing to be able to be present when a baby emerges into the world and to really support women and their babies. So, I don't really spend that much pre-time with the, the couple. I sort of meet them once. And then I go to the labor and I usually just do things like if they're clenching their hands, I'll like open their hands or just rub their head. And I always say at some point, you're a beautiful woman in labor. Or I might help them with their, their breath, like if they're going, ah, 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 pulling the energy up. I might say, try, ooh, 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 and bring the breath down. So, when I was asked by Janie and her partner to um, be their doula, I went to their house to meet them. And I sort of gave my little spiel how I really think, you know, natural birth can be a beautiful, powerful, spiritual, sacred way to have a baby, but that really my work is to support the woman. So I gave an example, like if you ask for, if a woman asks for an epidural, I often say, well, let's maybe get in the bath or try a different position or let's like wait a half an hour and then and then we'll see how you feel. And Janie said, no, no. If I ask for an epidural, I want an epidural. I'm like, okay, Janie, got it, clear, check. <laughs> so, so they called me a few a month or two after, and they're at the hospital, and I meet them at the hospital, and they're just getting checked in. And the nurse hands them a clipboard with the consent sheet, and Janie, who is in close, early active labor, takes it and starts crossing things out. I've never seen anyone read one of these, much less cross things out. So I say, Janie, you should be a lawyer. I am a lawyer. I, so I added, that, I added that question for my intake form. So we go in the room, and the labor's progressing. And I would say Janie is, at most, 25% receptive to what I have to say. Like, one point. I say, Janie, like, when you're going through the contraction, try to just imagine your cervix opening, like, just an open. I do not want to think of that. <laughs> Janie, to have some water. I don't like water. <laughs> but I'm just doing my best and just really trying to create a sacred space. And Janie says, I want an epidural. I'm like, get Janie an epidural now, now. So I'm not supposed to do that, but I just do labor support. But so the anesthesiologist comes and they say, Janie, we're really sorry, but your platelet counts too low and we can't give you an epidural. And if your platelet counts too low and they give you an epidural, there's a risk of bleeding in the cerebral spinal. It's really, really bad. And so Janie just like loses it. Like she just loses it. She's like gone into a place of just anger, frustration. She's just so mad she's giving birth. Like she's so pissed off. <laughs> And I'm doing everything I can, everything I can. I'm like just really like staying open and just making suggestions. Nothing I do helps. The nurses at one point are like, can you talk to her? <laughs> and so finally the baby's coming down. She's trying to push and she's like closing her legs. She's like pushing the baby in. I'm like, no, no, uh, you have to open your legs to have a baby. I like spent so much energy opening her legs. I was sore the whole next day. <laughs> So the baby emerges, and it's a beautiful baby girl, and, and she's fine. 
And um, for every birth I do, I always go home and try to write down one or two things I learned at the birth. And uh, the two things I wrote down after Janie's birth is one, before, up until Janie's birth, I really believed that you, one, had to relax and be open to the experience, and that was helping it along. And that's just not true. Sometimes labor just happens. <laughs> It's kind of like magical thinking. Like, I actually don't know if any of that relaxing I helped those women did had anything to do with the labor. And two, my job as doula isn't to like see the woman relax and do the things that I'm imagining she should do. It's just to like hold whatever emotion she's got and wherever she's at. And if it's anger and frustration, that, that's what a doula can do too. I do want to just say for the um, epilogue that they did invite me to the second birth. <laughs> her platelet count was 96. The cutoffs ate 100, but they let her have it. Yeah. And it was a beautiful birth. Thank you. I bet you'll be thinking about that story on the way home. Um, our, our next storyteller is Eric Hinderley. Yeah. I was really wanting to come through the side way and seem more official that way. Hi, I'm Eric. Um, I did not have the birth, uh, but I'm going to tell the story of our first daughter's birth, which was three years ago. Because we're in Gloucester, we're surrounded by water, water is very inspiring, and this birth had a lot of water in it. Um, all right. I didn't really know what to expect. We actually had a doula there, this awesome uh, woman named Kristen. She was very helpful, kept me involved, you know, pushing the hips like there, right? Like I was really good at that. I felt like I was really good at that. Some, you know, a few hours in, her water breaks. And the doula's like, now is go time. This is great. Let's call the birth center. We're at the Beverly Birth Center. Awesome place. Midwives, they have tubs of water for you to give your you know, the baby a birth in. So um, we're on our way, you know, um, live in Gloucester on Commonwealth Ave. You know, say hi to the rum line. I'm probably not going to see you for a while because uh, I'm going to be a new dad. So we're going, uh, you know, so I'm driving down. And my wife is really just like, you know, we have this old Honda Accord that her mom gave us, you know, stick shift. I'm relearning stick shift because who drives stick shift? But anyway. <laughs> Uh, we're going and she's yelling it's really painful I don't really know what to say I'm just like we're gonna be there we're gonna be there we're gonna go there um, we get there and she's just it's a lot of pain all of you know you probably know better than anybody <laughs> seven kids in ten years is wow um, so anywho um, she was only one centimeter and she, we couldn't stay in the birth center. Like, we couldn't stay there. I was really, you know, looking, you know, the doula was in a different car. And then she heard it. But, like, what do you do when the water breaks, right? It's like, this is go time. And it was one centimeter. So we have to go back to Gloucester. <laughs> and, you know, we're driving and the labor continues. You know, I'm pushing. We're, she, we have a tub. She's in there. I have, like, hot, not hot towels, but, like, wet towels put on her belly, you know. Say, you can do it. I have coconut water because water doesn't work. You need electrolytes <laughs> and things. So coconut water. Um, and we're not eating or anything. Her water breaks again. What? Yes. And it's go time. And, and the, I, you know, the doula, like, she can check the, it's just, you got to go. Uh, <laughs> So we're driving again by rum line, uh, you know, go around the rotary, we're going to Beverly, we're going, we get there again, and she's like two centimeters. And this was like, I don't know how many hours transpired. They can't take us. Like, we, we're, we're not there yet. Um, and, you know, this is supposed to be un, not supposed, but the birth plan, of course. We don't want medications if we don't need it. You get the epidural if absolutely necessary. My wife was with a prenatal yoga class, all five of them were going with this same kind of theme. Awesome people now, some of our best friends. Um, so I drive back to Gloucester. <laughs> I see the rum line again, maybe I will see it, but then we go up. Okay, so 
He's still giving coconut water, still doing everything. And the water breaks again, you guys. This is the third time of water breaking. She needs a lot of electrolytes, obviously, because I don't know how a human body produces whatever is in the amniotic sac, whatever. It's, it's a lot of water. Drive by the rum line, uh, uh, keep on going. Finally, they let us stay there. And the labor takes a long time. But the water does, we have the water tub. Uh, she's in there, the doula is amazing. Um, and the water has broken several times during that. Our child's head, and she's a very headstrong person now at three years old, um, the head kept on sealing the amniotic sac so that it would fill up again and then burst. Head would go there, fill up, burst. <laughs> head would go again, fill up and burst. Over and over again. Unfortunately, or you know, not unfortunately, but I had to take her across Beverly Hospital with a, you know, a sheet over her after laboring for a long time. Very up here, like, ah! <sighs> ah! You know, not, uh, but up here. So maybe that had something to do with it, but it was really up here. And it wasn't really going, it was like stuck at eight centimeters and not progressing. Um, she got in a wheelchair, I wheel her over, you know, naked with a sheet over her from Beverly. Birth center across the way to the hospital. Um, the midwife is with us, it's just not getting there. We do the epidural. You know, the epidural, it's, it's just like a circuit board. Um, I don't know, they put that thing on the back, gets it in. Luckily, she could still feel the contractions. And she pushed, and I turned into a Tom Brady, like, you know, football fan, like, let's go, come on, it's coming, it's coming. And she comes out. And we have our beautiful baby girl after several breakage of water. It's a Gloucester birth, lots of water involved, and now she's three years old and doing great. That's it. <laughs> Eric also has a two-month-old. So we just went through that again. Thank you, Eric. Our next storyteller, Phoebe Potts. Hi. Hi. Uh, so everybody gets born. We know that. Not everybody gets to give birth. Um, uh, I didn't. Um, I wasn't designed to give birth, um, which to look at me would be surprising, but these are purely ornamental. <laughs> I went through um, seven years thanks to the miracle of science and um, lots of uh, fertility treatments. I lay eggs like a goddamn salmon, and, I, uh, and nothing doing. It turns out, though, I'm not the only one who is designed to not give birth. You could consider our friend the sea turtle. She also uh, lays a lot of eggs in a hole at the beach. And then she's programmed to leave. And so the eggs, the, the tiny little babies are, are born, hatch, in darkness at night, and <laughs> they have to make it from the hole to the ocean, and there's this large, it's like the video game Frogger, like they have to cross this, <laughs> and there's predators circling all around with beaks like switchblades, and the first thing in these tiny little baby turtles' heads, the first thing that's on the screen is, RUN! <laughs> Your life is in peril! Which makes me just wonder about like God's R&D department, like the capriciousness, <laughs> and that it's not that maternal. So, but despite my experience, I'm still a, a huge fan of mammalian birth. And um, uh, I, was, uh, I lived with um, uh, ten tenant farmers in Mexico years ago. Um, they didn't invite me, and I didn't like fill out an application. I met them by chance, and I just stayed with them out of curiosity and loneliness, and they, <laughs> they let me stay out of curiosity and just excessive politeness, and, um, 
and in the afternoon, I would go with the children. Uh, we'd take the goats out into the, um, into the selva, into the sort of very brushy, uh, scrubby woods so that the goats could eat. And um, uh, one afternoon, this little girl came up to me, Ariseli, and she said, Phoebe, tiene que ver este, which, Phoebe, you got to see this. And uh, I walked over, and there's a goat, a full-size goat, and she, it's got a look on its face, uh, <laughs> kind of like, um, like it's standing in line at the DMV. And, <laughs> and, uh, she, and it's sort of like, this wasn't what I imagined for my life, but I will go on. <laughs> and, but out of this goat, uh, another goat is emerging. And that goat is, is beautifully folded and it has that sort of um, factory seal still on it. <laughs> and it slides down and it hits the earth. <laughs> and it unfolds and it stands up and it shudders and it walks. It walks right up to the DMV goat's teeth and it puts its head back and it starts having lunch. Now, I know we all think that our children are just beautiful, creative marvels, but none of them could do that. And I, have, I would wager that most of our children probably still have trouble walking into the kitchen and getting a snack. And this goat did it within seconds. So the mama goat turns and with the same expression, sees the baby goat sort of like, oh, you're here too. And, um, <laughs> but, but she smells it and she licks it and she welcomes it. And then out of the same orifice, this, this, um, this ball comes and it's gold and it's, and it's pink. And uh, it's like the, uh, you know, the glass blowing, how at the end it's sort of gold and pink and quivering. And I'm not a fan of bodily fluids. And um, I'm not a fan of glass blowing. And uh, <laughs> but the the, af the the afterbirth just slides down and hits the ground, and my heart is singing at what I'm what I've seen and what I'm seeing. And so, in just like your standard big dumb uh, gringa way, I go una vida nueva really loudly with a new life. And um. The, the children look like, oh, uh, the gringa is on sound and, and we are in the woods with her. And, um, <laughs> and the, but Ariseli, uh, the little girl, she's smiling because at nine years old, she's already a student of irony. And so that night <laughs> with her family and with her neighbors, she makes me tell the story like five, six, seven times and I have to keep saying, oh, no, no, no and everybody laughs. But I don't care that they laugh. Um, I don't care because a little teasing seems like a small price to pay to witness something so magnificent. Thank you. Phoebe, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I don't. Th I laughed a lot. I don't know if I've I've laughed that much. At, 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 um, Polly Hickey is our last storyteller. Um, I gave birth to my twins in a van in two different towns, actually. My husband Leo and I have six children, four of whom were born at home with a midwife by choice. Each of those, of course, is its own great story, but we can't tell all of them, or I can't, or we'd be here all night. Um, with the risks associated with giving birth to twins, I was headed to the hospital this time. They didn't want me to do a home, ha home birth. Uh, we lived in Magnolia, and we were going to the hospital in Stoneham. Um, it was about 40 minutes away. The hospital's not there anymore. The mid midwife could practice there. That's why we were headed there. A little visual of me pregnant. I'm all of five feet tall on a good day. <laughs> I, uh, my stomach was out so far, I couldn't, uh, I had to push the seat all the way back in the van, but then I couldn't like reach the pedals. Leo had to put a big block on the <laughs> van pedals. But a good 
Actually, a good thing was I could sit my coffee cup on my stomach and it would stay there. <laughs> Not so far. I was decaf, of course. So on April 4th, 1990, it was two weeks before the twins um, were due, but that can be a normal thing with twins. Um, we set up, we got things ready. I knew things were happening in the afternoon. I felt something going on. So we set up childcare for the other three that were at home. Ivy was four and a half. Ollie was three, and Tess was two and a half. So I had five, under five also. Um, we got the kids to the bed, and I, Leo recalls, I did say, uh, I thought it was progressing rather quickly. I, I did know that. I questioned staying at home, but we called the midwife, and she discussed it between us, and we decided oh, we're having twins, we better try to get there. Um, so we, I waddled out to the van, and the van itself was a 1983 Ford Econoline. It was Leo's old work truck. It was a two-toned, lovely brown color. It had bucket seats in the front and a bench seat in the back. And so I sat in the on the bench seat, my legs between the middle. And I had a silver bowl for throwing up, and I had my water and a towel. Uh, so we get out there, and the only real problem is is torrential, torrential downpour, like pouring so bad you can't even see out the window. And Leo distinctly remembers bald tires. He was thinking about the bald tires. Uh, so we get in the van, we head out, two miles an hour. It was, poor Leo, it was, I'm like moaning and throwing up, and somewhere around the Linfield-Wakefield line, uh, I said like, the baby's coming now, this baby is coming, I'm going to have this baby. You have to pull over. There's a head in my underwear. <laughs> Somehow he found the side of the road. Uh, Leo literally turns around, pulls my underwear down, and there was a head. He had, Leo had the wherewithal to, take the cord was around the neck, and Leo had the, the wherewithal to check. And he lifted out the cord and the shoulder. The baby came popping right out. Even more amazing is Leo had the wherewithal to suction the baby like they do with the little blue syringe. He used his mouth and he suctioned the baby's mouth and nose. And she made little noises, and that was Adeline. We put Adeline on my chest. Um, and everything, uh, we're thinking, okay, everything's okay. At that moment, Leo looks back and he sees the red lights shining, flashing, and the siren. And I'm thinking, oh, good. It was a torrential downpour, and she saw us on the side of the road. Police officer. I'm thinking, oh, good. A cop can help us. We'll know how to deliver the other baby, rush us to the hospital, whatever. So I may have not have mentioned at the time, Leo had long, black, curly hair, and he had just delivered the baby. <laughs> so he goes running out to the cruiser to tell the person, my wife just had a baby. My wife had a baby. I think he was probably a little scary looking. It happened to be a woman, and she's going, get back to the cruiser. Do not approach the vehicle. <laughs> and Leo just kept saying, my wife had a baby. She runs up. Finally, he got through to her. She makes him get in the van. She runs up. She's flashing a big flashlight on me, and I, she looked like deer in the headlights. <laughs> and I'm, I said, it's okay, it's our fourth baby, everything's fine, we had the other ones at home, we checked her, she's all right, everything's okay. Uh, but we have to go, to, Leo says, we have to go to the hospital, she's having another baby, she's having twins. At this point, I thought the poor woman was going to throw up. <laughs> she just was, didn't know what to do. Come to find out, she didn't know where the hospital was. Oh. She had to follow us to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> And we're going all of two miles an hour. <laughs> we drive all the way to Stoneham. In the parking lot, literally the entrance to the parking lot, I said, Leo, now I'm having a baby, now. And then I was feeling, and I, I, one of the risks of having twins is, is possibility of breach. They so turn around a lot. And I felt down and I said, oh no, it's breach, it's breach. Leo, being Leo, still driving, turns, doesn't even turn around, puts his hand back, says, no, that's the head. <laughs> Ma zooms around to the entrance, we're in the emergency entrance. The midwife comes running out that we had called ahead, all these men in white coats, and they, uh, they slide open the door. The midwife hops, oh, before that, Ava, we pull up, 
Leo literally turns around and caught the second baby that was oh. Ruth. Oh. And the midwife came running out, does the clamps and cuts the cords, and Leo uh, went with the babies into the hospital. Um, and the placenta was coming, and I said, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> so I came right to the placenta with the midwife helping me. And then I went, uh, they put me on a stretcher, and brought me in. Um, sorry. Um, it's not something I can really forget. <laughs> I delivered the placenta. <laughs> Leo, yeah, oh, the real, oh, this is the funny thing that Leo has interesting memories. Uh, memories of, he said that they kept calling them dirty babies because it was like an unsterile environment <laughs> during our dirty babies. Uh, but really, the, uh, the only real complication was that Ruthie, the second born, had a twin blood transfusion when a gush of blood comes from one placenta into the other twin, which is also a complication with twins. It was okay, but it can cause blood clots. So we did um, go to Children's Hospital, and they gave her a saline solution to, solution to thin the blood, and everything was okay. After about, um, we had an army of helpers helping us with the three kids at home, and um, I had come, friends coming to sit with one baby while well, I had the other one so that Leo could go home and get some sleep, because he wasn't gonna get any for the next 20 years or so. <laughs> After about five days, we had, everything was fine, and we had about enough. We checked ourselves out to go home, home to an overcrowded, messy, familiar chaos, filled to capacity with love. Aww. An amazing show, everyone. Thank you so much. Our next Fish Tales is December 1st. It'll be at the Gloucester Stage Company. And it's our big fundraiser, so please uh, come to that show. Thank you, storytellers. Thank you, audience. We can't do it without you. See you next time.